Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth lecture in our Fall 2023 Dean's Leaders and Lanyap Lecture Series. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement about the land we inhabit. The city of New Orleans was not built upon virgin land, but merely serves as a continuation of a great indigenous trade hub known in Choctaw as Balbacha, the place of other tongues. For thousands of years, people have lived along the Mississippi River and Balbacha served as a place for diverse cultures to come together. We acknowledge the, grand, the grounds of our campus and the city around us as home to numerous tribes before and after the arrival of Europeans. With gratitude and honor, Tulane University pays tribute to the original inhabitants of this land. The origins of this lecture series came from a school-wide desire to give our students the opportunities to meet and learn from some of the most distinguished leaders in public health. We aim to give our students the tools and experiences needed to become the next wave of innovative leaders and creating these, ch these ch chances to learn from an engaged leaders from around the nation is a priority of mine. This lecture series also boasts something distinctly New Orleanian, Lanyap. Lanyap is a concept you'll find throughout South Louisiana. It's an idea of adding a little something extra or unexpected and perfectly captures the art of hospitality we show our guests. We have adopted the concept of Lanyap by incorporating the arts into the public health lecture series. Each month accompanying these lectures, we will be activating the DeBall Gallery to host exhibits combining the arts and public health, providing alternative expressions to common public health topics. We hope after this lecture, you'll take the time to discover the exhibit in DeBall Gallery titled, The Separating Sickness, which explores the lives, and pat the lives of patients who lived at the Carville National Laboratorium in Carville, Louisiana, just up the river from us here in New Orleans. And now let me introduce this month's speakers. Dr. Hillary Godwin is a professor and dean at the University of Washington School of Public Health. She joined the University of Washington in 2018 following 12 years on faculty at UCLA Fielding School of Public Health and 10 years on the faculty at Northwestern. She holds a PhD in chemistry from Stanford University. Welcome, Dean. Welcome, Hillary. <laughs> we also have with us Dr. Sandro Galea, Dean and Robert A. Knox Professor at Boston University School of Public Health. Dean Galea is a phys physician, epidemiologist, and author, previously holding leadership positions at Columbia University, the University of Michigan, and the New York Academy of Medicine. Thank you both for being here today. And, and for sharing with our students and faculty and staff your experience uh, in leadership. We will start with Dr. Galea. Thank you, Dean Lavis. Thank you, Tom. Um, it's really a, uh, a privilege and an honor to be here with you all. It really is a particular honor to share the stage with Dean Lavis and Dean Godwin, two people who I admire very much and from whom I've learned very much over the years. So I was asked to talk for 15 minutes about leadership. I'm always uh, I've been intimidated to talk about leadership. I talk about all sorts of things, but uh, the supposition to talk about leadership is that I know anything about leadership. The truth is that while I've done it for many years, I always feel like leadership is a succession of failures and I'm trying to learn how to be better every day. But what I thought I would do is, given that I have the extraordinary privilege of being given the stage, is to try to offer you a distillation of some thoughts I've had over the years about the values that should guide leadership. and. Uh, the, the, the construction of this talk is, over the years, I have collected sort of bon mots, little snippets of things that have helped guide my leadership. And I collect them. I have a document, which I collect them in. And, and uh, because I was asked to speak here, this is the first time I've actually done this. I thought I would organize them in a way that hopefully is good for all of you. Um, uh, so I call this five values to inform leadership of public health. And I really am just going to talk about five values. And I'm centering my values around this. So this actually this is not mine. And none of these are mine. These are all in it. There's attribution at the bottom, and you can all um, uh, have that. Um, uh, this comes from the Milbank Fund, which is in one of the sort of old foundations in public health. And for a while, they had this um, um, sort of guiding principle, which now, now they've sort of moved beyond. But I really like it, which is leadership should be 
future-oriented, aware of the needs of many, inquisitive, principled, and pragmatic. And I really like this. And I'm actually going to talk about each of these. There are five values, future-oriented, aware of the needs of many, inquisitive, principled, and pragmatic. And those are going to be the five values which I want to talk about. And um, so I will start with number one, which is future-oriented. And I figure by organizing this way as five, for those of you who are bored in my talk, you know exactly where I am and when I'm going to sit down. Um, uh, so I'll start with number one, future-oriented. I actually think that there is no such thing as leading for the past. The job of the leader is to lead for the future, always, always, always. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean, just to be clear, dissing the past. It means respecting the past. It means building on the past. It means saying that the past has brought us to where we are today. But the job of leadership is always to look to the future. Now, one of the things that uh, emerges from that is this, which sounds banal until I actually think about it. This was uh, from Dr. Jeremiah Baroness. Unless something changes, everything stays the same. Now, let me explain it for a second because you're thinking, yeah, 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 I roll. Um, uh, I have learned in uh, my leadership career, which is now sort of about 20 years, is that when I talk to people in, uh, in public health and I say, um, uh, do you want everything to stay the same? Everybody says, no, 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 I don't want everything to stay the same. Then I say, well, do you want to change something? They say, well, I don't really want to change something. Nobody wants to change something, but nobody wants things to stay the same, which is, of course, a deep contradiction. So it is important to be able to be able to lead people to seeing that if you want to, things not to stay the same, if you want to evolve, things have to change. And that, I think, is a really important key um, uh, goal of a leader, is not only to shepherd that mechanically, but to motivate people into that kind of change. And my second uh, aphorism on this, on the part of Future Oriented, is from uh, one of my favorite uh, authors, um, um, Edith Wharton. Uh, who wrote an, sort of a number of uh, really interesting books, perhaps most prominently Age of Innocence. And Edith Wharton said, um, one can remain alive long past the usual eight data, uh, date, sorry, that's a type of date of disintegration. I like that phrase, past the usual date of disintegration. If one is afraid of, unafraid of change, insatiable in intellectual curiosity, and interested in big things. So we can stay alive past our age of disintegration if we are unafraid of change and have intellectual curiosity. That, to me, captures well the importance of being future-oriented, that ultimately the job of a leader is to be looking to the next, to be unafraid of change, to be have intellectual curiosity to look around the corner. And that means, part of this value, future-oriented, future, future -oriented, that you need to sort of be looking to where people are headed and you need to help people get there. And it is your job to always be thinking about tomorrow. So that's value one, future-oriented. Value two, aware of the needs of many. You know, leadership is, well, by definition, you're leading sort of a bunch of people. And um, aware of the needs of many means that those people have different needs. And uh, your job as a leader is to be aware of those needs and know how to manage them. That doesn't mean you're going to be meeting the needs of everybody all the time. But it does mean that you will not succeed in anything you do in leadership unless you're aware of those needs. And I have two different uh, quotes from different uh, people who I'd like to share. One of them is from Teju Cole, who is one of my favorite authors. He actually just has a new book out right now. And he has this quote which I really like. He says, it is about the incontestable fundamentals of a person, pleasure, sorrow, love, humor, and grief, and the complexity of the interior landscape that sustains those feelings. Now, why do I share that? I share that because that is what makes people. We are made with the combination of pleasure, sorrow, love, humor, grief, and interior landscape. And when we are in leadership, we, it is easy to lose sight of that. You know, we're dealing with people who we serve in a leadership position. It's easy to lose sight of the fact that the people are actually a sum of persons. And those persons all have pleasure, sorrow, lo love, humor, grief, and they all have different stages of those that they are experiencing. And depending on where somebody's at, in grief or in sorrow, they're going to react to the change, which is part of the future oriented I said a second ago, in a different way. Depending on where they are, in love and pleasure, they're going to react in different ways. And one needs to be aware of that. One needs to center how one tries to lead by being aware of the needs of many. And in the same breath as being aware from the, of the needs of many, um, and recognizing that in order to lead change, one also has to know when to do what 
depending on where people are at and when to be tolerant of where people are at. And my favorite quote about being tolerant of the needs of many comes from Pope John XXIII, who said, see everything, turn a blind eye too much, correct a little. I like this very much. The hardest part of this is turn a blind eye too much. But I think it falls, it fits very well with this notion of being aware of the needs of many, because the needs of many, the many will do and say all sorts of stuff that sort of isn't contributory to the path you're trying to lead on. And it is part of the wisdom of leadership and to know when to say, I'm just going to ignore that because that is part of somebody's love, pleasure, grief, sorrow. And that I need to accept and move on and not address it and correct a little when one needs to correct. So value one, future oriented, value two, aware of the needs of many. Value three, inquisitive, inquisitive. Um, you know, it is easy to fall on just sort of doing things the way we do them. And uh, I want to offer this from Stephanie Kowalik. Stephanie Kowalik was a, a very prominent scientist who actually discovered Kevlar. And I loved her quote, all sorts of things are, are, can happen when you're open to new ideas and playing around with things. Um, uh, I actually think this uh, lecture series is a nice example of that. When uh, Lynn Lavist invited me, I'm like, what is Laniac? What, what, what is Tom doing? Um, uh, but... Um, you know, I said, yes, well, because it's Tom, but also because I'm like, huh, because you're like thinking of ideas, thinking of new ideas of what to do things. And I actually think being inquisitive, doing things that are innovative is, is a core part of leadership. And I'll actually offer this um, diagram as a way to sort of uh, uh, push us to think about inquisitiveness and looking at things differently. You're all looking at this saying, what is this creature? Anybody know what this creature is? This creature is a kangaroo. Now, you're all saying, that's not a kangaroo. Well, the person who drew this, Cornelis de Hode, was a Dutch artist in the 17th century who never saw a kangaroo. But Cornelis de Hode talked to sailors who had seen a kangaroo, Dutch sailors. And they said it was a creature with powerful, powerful uh, punch and long neck, and she carries her babies around in a pouch. And that's what he drew. The point is that... We see the world in very particular ways. And if we're not careful, we make serious mistakes. I mean, this looks nothing like a kangaroo. We can all be smug about it now because we've all seen kangaroos, but he didn't know. One has to be inquisitive and say, how are we seeing the world? How am I seeing the world differently? And what should the world look like? That is the third value of leadership. Fourth, principled. One needs to have a core set of principles in leadership. Um, uh, now, you know, one could spend a whole hour talking about principles and what, what are the right principles. So I want to distill principled into a sub of just four. I want to talk about four of them. Integrity, hard work, compassion, and self-restraint. And I just want to show one slide on each of these. Um, these are the four principles that I have found most useful to me in, um, in my work. So they're my, my guiding light, as particularly when things are difficult. And let me just talk about each of them. Integrity. Um, what do we mean by integrity? There's many things, many things one can mean by integrity, but I mean integrity to be living in a way that actually elevates everybody else around you, even when times are difficult and when there are disagreements. So I thought I would show a quote from two people who disagreed on almost everything. Um, on the right, is, these are both Supreme Court Justices Clarence Thomas. On the left, um, the late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And Clarence Thomas said, Justice Ginsburg and I often disagreed, but at no time during our long tenure together were we disagreeable with each other. She placed a premium on civility and respect. And I think civility and respect are the core tenets of integrity, which I think are inseparable from leadership. It is civility. It is respect. It is being a whole with who you are that shows everybody that you respect who they are as well. So principle one, integrity. Principle two, hard work. Leadership is just hard work. They never pay you enough for it. You know, you get a pay bump and your leaders never, never enough. So I come back, the only person who makes a, two appearances in my talk is Edith Wharton. That's how much I like her work. Um, um, Edith Wharton said, we have to make things beautiful. They do not grow so of themselves, which is actually often not appreciated in, uh, in leadership. Like they're, they're, they're sort of sometimes, I think in uh, our communities, this vague nebulous notion, oh, it's going to be fine. It's going to run itself. Things will happen. Actually, they don't. 
left to its own devices, our human systems uh, uh, trend towards chaos. Leadership actually requires the active management of what we're doing to make things happen. She uses this beautiful phrase, we have to make things beautiful. And I would consider a well-run institution of any kind to be a beautiful thing. And one has to do that, which means, you know, leadership is a job of being on top of that at all times. So two, hard work. Three, compassion. You'll see that this has echoes of the aware of the needs of many, but I think compassion is a really important character, uh, trait. I have written about how compassion is different than empathy. Compassion is different than empathy in the following way. Empathy says, I feel your pain because I can imagine your pain. That's empathy. Much of the time, I can't imagine your pain. It's actually not true. But I shouldn't have to imagine your pain. I should be compassionate because we're, we're fellow human beings. And uh, this is Khalid Hosseini who wrote, one is well served by a degree of both humility and charity when judging the inner workings of somebody's heart. I find that very important in leadership. So many times in leadership, you're tempted to say, I can't believe she said that. Like she must have malintent. I can't believe he did that. He must try to be undermining me. Actually, maybe not. Maybe not. There may be many, many other reasons why somebody did that. And I think one is well served by having humility and charity when judging the inner work in somebody's heart to say, I don't know why she said that. I don't know why he did that. But let me be tolerant of it to go back to the earlier comment. That's compassion. And then number four is self-restraint. Um, uh, keep calm and be deliberate. You know, it is never, ever, ever the right thing in leadership to react without thinking, ever. There's just like never, uh, it's never right. It is never right to send that annoyed email. It is never right to make the annoyed statement. It is the act of being deliberate in what one says. That doesn't mean, by the way, being ponderous and never doing anything, not at all. It means actually having the discipline to regulate what one says, when one says it, how one says it. And that is a lot of work. So that's what I mean by um, principle. And my fifth uh, value is pragmatism. Um, um, you know, I think often we mistake, particularly in, uh, in uh, a mission-oriented field like public health, we mistake our job as sort of being the, you know, the, the stalwart knights of unyielding virtue in what we do. And that's just simply wrong. This is from uh, Soji Ade, who said, ideological absolutism and romantic attachments to perfection are not virtues. I really like that. And I think we don't say it enough in public health and certainly don't say it enough in leadership you're never going to achieve everything you're trying to achieve. You're never going to achieve the purity of that vision that we actually write about. You know, public health is an aspiration. We are aspiring to something which we're never quite going to get to. And we need to recognize that. And it means we need to be ready to make the compromises in order to get us there. And, you know, we are, I bet when I said the word compromise, you all had a small shudder down your spine. We don't talk about that. Or you also thought, ah, He's old, he's talking about compromise. I'm young, I know I will get my way. For all of you who are younger than me, for most everybody in this room, you won't always get your way. In fact, you'll seldom get your way. That's okay, that doesn't mean it's a defeat. It simply means the wisdom is in knowing when you compromise what you compromise on in order to keep moving us forward. I'll end with one last aphorism, which is uh, from Maya Angelou, who said in this context, hope and fear cannot occupy the same space, invite one to stay. You know, leadership is terrifying. It's like riding a unicycle on top of a waterfall and a gale howling while wearing a blindfold. It's really very scary. Um, um, so you can be afraid and look down and fall, or you can hope you're going to make it to the other side and keep moving forward. And, you know, I suppose I, I share these five values because I have found them useful to guide my thinking. I find them that there are things that I go back to pretty regularly. I actually go back to them like sort of every day. I'm like, what are the values that inspire me? What are the values that actually keep me true to my mission? Because it's amazing how much in the day-to-day, -day, in the maw of the details, one forgets why one does what one does. Hopefully that's, that's useful to all of you. Just if uh, you'll permit me for two, two second quick plug, the book on the right just came out December 1, if anybody's interested in sort of my thoughts on public health. And the left is a, a blog, which actually I try to write my thoughts. And those are URLs for that. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege to be here with you. Thanks, Sandra. I, I think probably the least desirable thing uh, in public health is to have a 
have to talk following Sandra, so <laughs> but I will do my best. Um, let's see if I can get this clip on. No, all right, I'm gonna set it right here. Okay, um, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm gonna take a slightly different turn. I am gonna spend some time um, talking about um, the values that I return to again and again um, in leadership roles, but I also thought I'd share with you the part that the things that you can't get out of my resume, some of the, one of the students asked earlier, what, what advice would you give to your earlier self? Um, and, and I think it's helpful, particularly for students who are near to the beginning of their career to hear that many things happen that you can't anticipate. Um, and sometimes it's just about those opportunities that present themselves. So first of all, um, values. Uh, I, I can't do better um, than Sandra, but I, and I agree with all the things that you said. Um, I will say the way that for me, that I frame my values and leadership are seeking alignment with the values that I love in public health. So one of those values, and I think that hopefully we can all agree on, is that we really value prevention in public health. And so as a leader, I try to remember that there's lots of times when I'm going to have to react to the moment, um, but my job is also to be looking at the landscape um, that we exist in, looking at what are the bigger issues that are causing problems that are more systemic and how we might address those so that we can deal with those issues that we could reasonably anticipate um, before they come home come up and perhaps prevent them from coming up. Um, also within public health, um, I think we would all agree that the most sustainable solutions come from the communities that are most directly affected and the individuals that are most directly affected. And likewise, as a leader, I think it's really important to um, have those conversations to engage early and often with stakeholders and to lift up what we hear from those individuals who, um, whose voices might typically be marginalized or historically have been marginalized um, and to engage with those groups throughout um, the process of coming up with solutions and implementing solutions. Likewise, uh, we know it's incredibly important to look at the context. So I mentioned earlier that um, thinking about what are those systemic issues that contribute to the problems that we're experiencing within our organization. Um, and to Sandra's point, saying, how might we move beyond those? How, what, what are the changes that are within our control? Um, and how can we facilitate those knowing that there will be people who will be uncomfortable with those changes? Um, but giving name to the things that we can't solve perhaps like structural racism, um, but that act, uh, in so many ways define um, the situation in which we find ourselves and constrain the solutions that we can come up with. Um, by naming them, we honor those who are most deeply affected by them, but also allow ourselves to move to, to a better place. And finally, uh, echoing something that, that Sandra said as well, I think um, w one of the things I love most about public health is that while we are deeply committed to solutions that focus at the community or population level, that we also have deep respect for people as human beings. We recognize that each person is unique, they're fallible, but miraculous in their own special way. And that finding that joy and learning about people as individual human beings and understanding their perspectives, their own context um, as a leader um, makes the path that much, much easier and more joyful. So with that, um, I will turn to giving you a little bit of insight into my own pathway. So I, what I frequently hear from people in public health is this sort of like, how did you end up going into public health with a PhD in chemistry? And I almost think of it as like, how did I end up being in chemistry for so long when I really belonged in public health? Um, so let me, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, 
uh, I have an identical twin, so I know that genetics are not, don't determine everything in terms of um, who you are um, and that your lived experiences also influence um, who you become and, and the way that you engage with the world. Um, my twin and I were raised by field biologists. And so I would say the the religion that I was raised in was a deep appreciation for the natural world and all of um, the animals that live on that world with us and um, finding our place in that world um, without assuming that we have priority over other beings and knowing that we deeply affect um, other systems and and the world that's available to other other creatures and that that's a privilege. I went to college at a university that at that point uh, really stuck to this dogma of pure science. There was no school of engineering, let alone a school of public health. And so even though I went there thinking that I wanted to be perhaps an anthropologist or a clinical psychologist, I left with a degree in chemistry it was something that I was passionate about when I was there. And because I came from an academic family, I went straight into graduate school. I didn't stop and do what I so frequently encourage our students to do, which was to experience the real world, to do jobs, to find out what I liked and what I didn't like, to figure out more about what different opportunities were. Um, and I loved the work that I did in graduate school, but it was really esoteric. Sure, like all of you, when you heard physical chemistry, you're like, oh my God, it was it was that kind of super esoteric uh, work. And I came out of it feeling like if I died in that moment, it would have made no difference to anyone other than the people that loved me. Um, and so I left feeling like I really wanted to um, find a way to use the skills that I had built in a way that would have some more positive impact on the world around me. Um, so I did a postdoc at, at Hopkins in the School of Medicine, doing something slightly less esoteric, which was working on biophysical chemistry, um, and then started a faculty position so young, like I was 28 when I started my first faculty position, um, in a chemistry department, um, and chose to work on trying to understand why lead is poisonous. And that is not a topic that chemists at that point in time were working on. Um, and so many people would ask me like, what, what sort of this, like, why are you maligning our beautiful chemicals by suggesting that they might not be good for people? Um, and, and over time, um, I started working with folks in the Chicago Department of Public Health, with people working in primary prevention of lead poisoning. And I realized that that was where my heart was. Um, I also experienced I would say my 20s and 30s were years that were characterized by a lot of illness and death um, in my family and personally. Um, my husband's sister uh, died when we were seniors in college, just before our senior year. Uh, my own much younger brother was diagnosed with what we thought was a curable cancer when I was in grad school um, and died after three bone marrow transplants when I was an assistant professor. And four years after he died, I was diagnosed with a cancer and told, uh, told that I had three to five years to live. So although I was doing work that I loved, those cu accumulated lessons left me with this feeling of how could I amplify the impact that I, that I was having in the world? And so when it, there came to be an opportunity and again, so like I think back, I'm like, oh my God, I was so young. Like at age, I guess 35 or 36, um, to be an associate chair in my department, I thought I'm gonna do that because I don't know whether or not the research that I'm doing is going to come to fruition while I'm still here. And it through this leadership role, I could have that kind of lasting impact that I would want to have. And I loved it. And so when I, there was the opportunity to become chair of that department, I stepped into that role. And then like stars aligning, I had an opportunity to uh, move to UCLA 
to be chair of the Department of Environmental Health Sciences, which matched my research perfectly, but also just was like a moment of coming home for me. Really like the that sense of my personal values in alignment with the values of the field and the institution. Um, I don't know if I would have made that change if I hadn't had that sort of those years of reckoning with mortality that immediately preceded that move. Um, but I'm so glad that I moved. It was the best decision um, for me, both personally and um, professionally. Um, and since then, other opportunities have come my way um, to be an associate dean, to be a dean. Um, and each time I, I feel privileged and gratitude um, that people have display trust um, that that I could listen, to, that I would listen to them, that I would be there, um, and that I would try to make our space a better place in addition to the world around us a better place. So um, I think I'm going to stop there. And um, but I'm happy. I usually, usually when people ask me, like, how did you get into leadership? I just start with the like, oh, I had an opportunity to move to public health. Um, but I figured. You wanted a little extra, I gave you a little extra. So there we are, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Okay, There's great. That. So um, we have uh, the microphone for uh, questions from the audience. Is that, we'll bring it around, okay. So um, if you have questions, please do raise your hand. This is an opportunity for you to engage with these two um, fantastic deans. Um, and I'll, I'll start by asking a few questions. Go for it. I want to start with you, Sandra. I want to ask you Hillary's question, right? The, the question was um, advice that you would give to your younger self. What advice would you give? <laughs> um, well, we, we, um, Hillary and I had an opportunity to chat with some students earlier, and, and uh, they asked that question. Um, uh, and I guess I'll answer it the same way. I will answer a professional question. I'll answer it professionally and personally. Um, professionally, the, um, I guess the advice has two pieces. Number one is you should know it's going to be fine because things will happen that are unexpected. Hillary's you know, personal uh, path illustrated that my personal path also had the same, had unexpected turns and it's going to be fine. I think in one's younger self, one is very anxious about, you know, ma making sure it's going to be fine and here to tell you it's going to be fine, even if it's going to be in ways you don't expect it. I couple that from the professional sphere with uh, one needs to be open to opportunities. One needs to be open to things that are least expected. I think in Hillary's journey that she so kindly shared with us is a beautiful example of that, of going from chemistry then to being Dean of Public Health. And that's being open to opportunities and open to, div to divergences and paths. So it's going to be fine, but one has to be open to opportunities to say yes to opportunities to explore that. That's on the professional side. On the personal side, um, uh, I combine it in one simple piece of advice, which is do more yoga. And uh, I mean that as a student correctly asked, both literally and figuratively. Um, uh, one only gets less flexible as one gets older. And uh, it, one is more flexible the more one practices flexibility at a younger age. So I mean that physically, yes. But actually, um, psychologically, I mean that you know we quickly get into rigid habits of mind as uh, we get along in our trajectory. And, uh, and having a habit of mind of flexibility, open-mindedness um, um, serves one well on the personal and professional space. That's the advice I would give my younger self. Well, since you answered that question earlier, uh, let me ask both of you to ask, uh, give Hillary an opportunity to answer the question as well. How did you answer it with the students? Oh, how did I answer it with the students? Yeah. yeah. Um, so one was uh, that they actually asked slightly the like, what's the advice you would give to your younger self? Did you ask the same one or did you say? Yeah. yeah okay. So one definitely would be um, to let go of sort of that fear of failure. I was very afraid as a young adult of failing and the, the greatest opportunities I've had for learning have been in the thick of some really deep failures. So I think that's mm -hmm. one. Um, I would have advised, I didn't say this to the students, but now that you've heard more about my personal journey, 
Um, I would have told my earlier self to like take the time to be human. Um, and I try and tell this to both both my the students in our school and the faculty and staff in our school is when you're going through a major life event to give yourself the space to experience it and to be with the people that you love at the time because those times don't come back. Um, and I, I think I tried to do that at the time, but I, I don't know that I managed it as well as, or gave myself as much grace as I probably would have yeah. encouraged other people to. And then um, the other piece of advice is one that I did share with the students um, that my stepmother gave me early on um, when I was really stressed out when I first started as an assistant professor. And she said, um, take one day of every weekend to rest. Don't do work on at least one day of every weekend. And, um, and at the time I thought, well, I do like half a day on Saturday and half a day on Sunday. And she's like, nope, doesn't count. You need like a 24 hours when you know, going into it, that there will be no work. Mm -hmm. And um, she shares my love of sleep. So I think part of it was knowing that like, there's part of the rest that comes just from getting good rest. I think there's also the rejuvenation that you get from letting your mind be free of worries and if you're at a point where work is a source of worries the like giving yourself that time that you know for the next 24 hours i'm not thinking about those things to me is a very rejuvenating and important mm -hmm. part of being human so is 24 hours enough to rejuvenate? I mean, do, how? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> really? So 24. So Especially I, in this job. In this job, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think bare minimum, I mean, this is, I, I genuinely believe this is why many of the Earth's major, the world's major religions have a Sabbath, right? It's like people knew you need a day, people need a day of rest, mm -hmm. right? And, but it's not to say that you don't mm -hmm. also need vacations. So that's mm -hmm. another one that I... You know, I, when I'm, the people that are direct reports to me, when we meet um, for annual reviews, I always say, and what are your plans for taking vacations this year? I'm super clear. Like, you don't have to travel far away. It can be a staycation. But, like, that needs to be part of the plan. Um, I personally, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but, like, mm -hmm. the most beautiful vacations are when you can take more than a week. I find there's, like, this change after a week away where it's like, you don't feel like you have to answer the emails and you can just like let go in a way that you, that you don't when you're just taking a week or less off. So it's not always possible, mm -hmm. but if you can like two weeks, oh, two weeks, the best, right? Mm -hmm. That's a great vacation. Okay, well, let's keep this going. Then how do you transition out of the vacation and come back to Oh work? my God. <laughs> so, Transitioning out, I refer to that coming back both on Monday um, and also particularly coming back from vacation as re-entry. I imagine myself mm -hmm. as like an astronaut hitting, you know, the atmosphere and, you know, Earth's gravitation out after being free out in space. And that is what it feels like because you feel this like, oh, of like, oh, the problems are still here, right? So, I, you know, we all struggle with that, right? I think mm -hmm. it just, again, it helps to name it and to extend grace to yourself of it's going to be hard that that first day or two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All those emails you've been ignoring are oh, still they're, there. They're still there. Yeah, for sure. So what about you, Sandra? What, what, um, you, uh, yeah, the. Uh, I mean, I'm going to say something that I, I know is going to be radical for public health audiences because, you know, I've learned over time that... Uh, people in public health really believe in their mission. So my um, my spouse and I, for um, 20 years, with the exception of childbirth and pandemics, we always um, um, go away for a full month in summer. Ooh. We actually, I, I know, I know. I, I say that people in public health say, that's how could you do that? Like I'm, I always feel like I get castigated for even mentioning it. Um, um, we, uh, I, um, we work in that time, like a little bit, like we, but we have always found that um, being away out of our context for a month. And, you know, that um, we've done like, you know, various combinations of that. Sometimes it's sort of 
you know, exotic, like we're able to get away for a month to Europe. Both of us are vaguely European in our background. Sometimes it's like a month on Cape Cod. Sometimes it's a mix. Um, um, but saying there is a month away and we time it specifically for the sort of quietest time in the academic calendar, which is typically sort of- Yeah, when is that? It's all, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it is for all of us, it is, it is for all of us, end of July, beginning of August is the quietest time in the calendar. That's actually, mm. I, have, I, have, I have the empiric email data to show for that. Um, <laughs> um, but so for us, that has actually been important and restorative. And I think, you know, different people have important restorative, restorative. I mean, that's my pattern, but, mm. you know, I think what Hillary is saying, what I'm saying are roughly the same thing, that mm. you need to figure out what is restorative for you yeah. and and, uh, and for us that's been our path and you do one vacation a year yes yeah. yes yeah, so oh. and then I and mean, that we, sustains I mean, you for the whole the next 11 months i mean you know, then we take between you know, christmas and new year which is that to me okay again i want to also offer anyone in the audience opportunity to ask any questions you might have i can get to talk to these people anytime so <laughs> if, please do oh. okay um Oh, well, we got a question. Okay. Hi, my name is Emily Harris. I uh, am in the Department of Health Policy Management, um, and I, I also teach leadership in healthcare settings. And one of my, uh, my question has two parts. And in, in my experience uh, in the healthcare industry, one of the toughest parts of being a leader, especially when you transition a lot, is the past and dealing with the past. So I guess in, in hearing both of you, you, you know, y'all's you know, progression and leadership, the two part question is one, what is the moral obligation to the people, the the organization that you're, you're leading and dealing with those past issues uh, that you then assume as a new leader? And two, if you could just talk about some of either the successes or failures you've had in that. Mm -hmm. You want to start? Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, um, yeah. One of our colleagues, who's no longer a dean, um, um, would uh, introduce himself as the interim dean when he was the permanent dean. And um, the reason he did that, which I actually quite liked, is because out of recognition that we're all interim. One of the beautiful things about uh, institutions is that they're bigger than all of us. And, uh, you know, I am the interim dean because there will be another dean after. In fact, it will be a colossal failure if there was no dean after, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the I think I say that because, you know, you asked about sort of the moral obligation to the past. I think one has as much a moral obligation to the past as one has to the future. Um, uh, so I think when one enters a uh, an institution in a leadership role, either from the outside or from the inside, one has an obligation to respect the past and to recognize the past for what it achieved and one has to resist the temptation that says you know as i said earlier unless something changes everything stays the same change does not mean that the past was wrong the past was right for the past that is different than saying the future needs to be right for the future so i think that is critically important as a steward of change and and as i argued earlier all leadership is ultimately is, is ultimately shepherding or stewarding change so i think that's that was the first half of your question. What's the second half of your question? Examples. Oh, example. Yeah, and you know, I, I'll actually lean on an example from. Uh, I have the privilege of sort of chairing board of a large, um, not-for-profit organization, and that is currently going through a very, very difficult um, a moment of change management. And um, I won't get into the details, but the one of the things that has emerged from that is. Um, when you have really difficult change organizations, uh, change management moments in organizations, the respect for the past is ever more important. Like, like when things are harder, all these fundamentals of leadership become ever more important. And as a result, the, the continual reminder that just as much as we need to change, if we need to change a hundred things, it is 10 times more important that we celebrate the past than if it is if we only need to change 10 things. And, and because I think that shows a respect for those who have come before and for the fact that most people have been there before and they've been trying to do the right thing. Yeah, great question. Um, I, I was just gonna jump to the failures, but um, <laughs> I'll pontificate a little bit first. Yeah, totally agree. Absolutely, you have to 
learn the past. So this is what's hard about coming in as a leader from the outside. So I was a department chair that was internal and then subsequently a department chair that came in from the outside, way harder to come in from the outside because you don't have all that context. Um, yeah, important to honor the past, but also understand that even if, I think there's a, a tendency to come in and think I'm new, so I don't bring with me like I get to escape the baggage of the past. And I think my experience has been that is not true, that while you may not have the baggage, um, that everyone else does. Um, and so understanding how each of them have experienced that um, and how that influences their wariness about change or desire for change or any number of different things is, is really important. Um, when I came to UW as Dean, um, a lot of people said to me, have you heard about our incident from 2016? And um, my standard response was, I have heard about it, but I'd like to hear your perspective on what happened. Um, and I learned it was such a different, it, it, so this was a, a racist incident where there hadn't been healing from it. Um, or not a, adequate healing for many members of the community. Um, and it really did have huge, profound impacts on what people, how people experienced each other and our organization. And it didn't matter that I hadn't been there when it happened. It still was really important. Um, so it was help, really helpful to hear different perspectives on it. Um, I think In retrospect, I probably didn't realize how profoundly it still was influencing dynamics in our school for a very long time and still continues to. Um, so we're still trying to figure out like, how do we handle that? Yeah. And I'm not, I don't know that it ever will be. You know, like, it's not like you, grow out of it right so yeah yeah okay anyone else okay then i guess i'll go sandra why why do you do this i mean anyone who is anyone who's who's smart enough to get accepted to a school of public health get a master's degree is smart enough to go into any other field and make a lot of money we don't we don't make a lot of money but what drives you to do this? Why did you make this choice? Hmm. Yeah, it's a it's it's a question I ask myself every day. Um, uh, <laughs> the um, I think I have been extraordinarily privileged to be able to have a career which pays the bills. One can imagine many other careers that pay the bills more abundantly, but. It's fine. I'm, I'm fine. Um, uh, while also doing something that I care about passionately and deeply. You know, when I advise students all the time, so like, you know, since what should I be doing? I say, I don't know what you should be doing, but you should be doing something at the intersection of four circles. Number one, I'll start backwards. With Asia. Number one is it needs to pay the bills unless you're independently wealthy, right? don't come from any wealth, so I need to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. Number two, it should be something you're good at. Number three, it should be something you like to do. The two are not the same. And number four, it should be something the world needs. You know, most people don't have the privilege of intersecting at the, uh, those four. And mm -hmm. this, for me, has been at the intersection of those four. It is something that I think the world needs. I can make a small, tiny, tiny, tiny contribution. but a small contribution. It's something which I think my particular mix of strengths and weaknesses are good at, and I like it. You know, I'll counter, perhaps sometimes it's easier to sort of explain these things by comparison with something else. Yeah, just, you know, not infrequently, and just today I had an email in my inbox, somebody says, you know, all this stuff you talk about, about social safety nets and policies, why don't you run for office? My answer to that is, I'd be terrible in public office. Like, I, know, yeah. I know myself enough. I'm, there are just so many failures I have that actually would be terrible in that mm -hmm. position. So I say that by contrast with hopefully my particular skills combinations lend themselves to this. I do it because 
it's a wonderful privilege to be able to do it and to be able to look back and say, I've been able to pay the bills doing something that makes a small difference and that I like and I'm good at. Mm -hmm. And Hillary, what about you? I don't know how I can, I mean, that the completely resonates with me. I was going to say because I am able to, um, like, because. Oh, but you could have done so many able. other things too. What? You could have done so many other things also. What? Uh, so I would I'm say just... the intersection of uh, like people will let me do it and and it brings me joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I would agree with the like sort of this yeah. No, but you said it perfectly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because it matters. Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean that's that's mm -hmm. part of the um that brings me joy is that it matters, but I also really love people. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something so rewarding about, you know, I think all of us would agree, public health is, it's hard, right? The work that we do is hard. And I see so many in our schools of public health, we have so many people who have such great skills and passions and want to make the world a better place and are going to make the world a better place. And if I, through my daily activities, can make it easier for them to do that, can lift them up and and um, tear down some of the barriers, that to me is just incredibly rewarding. And if he wasn't doing this, what else would you be doing? I'd be baking pies. I love to bake pies. That's my fallback um, career. And most recently, this sounds like totally useless, but um, God, I, this year weeding has been like, I love to garden, but weeding has just been like, I, I don't know why, just like it's been my thing this year. I love to weed, just mm -hmm. yanking. Oh, wait, yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> I wouldn't have predicted that answer. Yeah, Sandra. <laughs> Yeah, what would you be doing? I hope you ask me that because I, I'm not very good at many things, so I don't know. Um, um, I keep getting, I mean, there's many things I like to do, but I'm not sure they would pay the bills. So, um, yeah, you don't get much. Yeah. Oh, I didn't, say, well just, I didn't say it had to pay the bills, but but, yeah. but 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 again, I come back to my to my fifth value pragmatically. Mm. Yeah. I do need to pay the bills. I, yeah. I, I'm just I'm just being completely honest, like, mm. like, like, unless one has other, I mean, I don't know about you all, but uh. I need to pay the mortgage. I need to pay for my kids to go to college. Like there actually is a very pragmatic need mm -hmm. for a day job. Um, uh, you know, I would like nothing better than to uh, run a bakery, but I wouldn't be able to pay the bills. Too. Yeah, that's just the reality. Mm -hmm. I think it's okay to admit to realities that yeah, they constrain yeah. us. That's okay. Okay. We have a question over here. We got a question. Hi, uh, thank you much, very much for your experiences and your, and your and your talks on leadership today. Uh, I'm Dave Washburn. I'm also in health policy and management like Emily. And we've heard a lot sort of from very strategic levels and sort of guiding visions of leadership. But I think there's also some tactical things uh, that you can do when you're in leadership positions and organizations. You had mentioned um, asking people about their plan for vacations. That's sort of a, you know, a small little thing that you've, but you've built that into your annual review as a tactic to try to build culture, to build leadership, to build relationships. Are there other types of other little snippets of wisdom that you have from your experiences leading institutions or departments um, of tactical things that you do to make sure that you're helping to build leadership throughout the organization when you can't be everything everywhere all at once? Um, a couple of things. So one is um, similar to the ask, asking proactively about vacations. When um, people in our community, whether they report to me directly or not, um, need to take time off to take care of themselves or to take care of their loved ones, I try to very vocally reinforce that I understand that it's hard in our academic environment to prioritize those things, but I deeply appreciate that they are doing it. Um, and I think it's it's helpful to, to say that in the moment. Um, there are, I try to, so 
I try not to, I try to get rest and I try to bring my best self to work um, because people need me to be present and also emotionally available and calm. Um, I don't always succeed with that, but I try to acknowledge when I've not succeeded and go back to the person and talk to them about it. Um, I think acknowledging our own humanity as, as leaders is, um, and that our intentions are not always how we, where we land are, that are two things that are important. Um, we were, we've been talking a lot over the last couple of days about just the importance of, of naming things that are hard, um, even if we don't have control over them. I think that's another one. Well, Sandra, what about you? Yeah, no, I mean, I, whatever everything Hillary said, I guess the, the um, just to distill it quickly from, you know, my all my successes and all my failures in leadership are about people. So um, the, you know, you asked tactically, it is, you know, choosing the people who are sort of, you know, in the leadership team as however it's defined in a particular institution and then really investing in those people in uh, very practical um, ways. Like I try to be very engaged with those people, with uh, what they're doing, with um, supporting them in their personal and professional aspirations um, uh, because their success is your success, is the institution's success. So tactically, um, um, in, you know, investing in the people who actually do are doing the work, who extend the vision, the aspiration um, uh, of uh, that you're trying to bring to an institution is is everything. Mm -hmm. Yes, question there. Um, Hillary, you mentioned um, that when you that you became a researcher mm -hmm. on lead poisoning mm -hmm. and that that was quite new mm -hmm. and then you moved at some point to a school of public health as a chemist so in both instances you were doing things that were unusual mm -hmm. and uh and that maybe you found yourself at the margins in both places mm -hmm. and oftentimes being at the margins and the friction that it creates leads to innovation and uh, at the same time, you need support if you're doing that. So you're both in positions where you can, you know, I'm sure you'll find students, faculty who are trying to do things that are unusual. And, uh, and you know that supporting them is going to be a going to make a big difference. But you may also find things that are unusual and that you may not really want to buy into. So how do you, you know, how do you deal with, with that, with supporting or not supporting people who are trying to break new ground or doing things that are maybe considered at the margins? Yeah, so one of the things I learned fairly early on in my career is I like that, I call it, I like being on the steep part of the learning curve, right? So I like that, that part where you, I'm personally learning and it's a new, um, I'm less great about the like wrapping up the, at the end. Um, and that's where it's really important to like have a leadership team where you have people who, whose strengths um, and passions complement your own. Um, I'm, I was actually struck by like, I was trying to think of when there's a case where I haven't been excited about someone doing something new and innovative. Um, I, I feel like I, I'm more often trying to tamp down my like enthusiasm for newness and change because I have, I am very aware that most people do not like the amount of change and innovation that I seek. Um, so, uh, but I like, I can't imagine like a faculty member, like not supporting a desire for innovation. I also, I trust implicitly that like, we want to hire people who are innovative and who are change agents. I mean, to me, that that is part parcel of, of what we do in public health, right? So 
I, I don't know. I, I would hope that I would be supportive. I should have to ask the people that you know in my school and let's see mm -hmm. whether it's true. But yeah, I aspire to be supportive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I agree with all that just very quickly. I think, uh, you know, as with everything we do within um, institutions, I think you support people through two ways. One is through making sure you have the policy and administrative structures that support yeah. people. And the other one is through having the norms that support people. I think those are two different things. And I think they're both functions of what leaders set up. So I think one would need to make sure that um, on the former, that there are structures where people who are different can succeed, whatever that is, be that through the appointments, promotions, be that through um, them being suitably mentored despite being different and all that. That's number one. And number two on the norms, I think uh, our words, actions, language needs to create spaces for people who are different than uh, what is um, uh, perhaps the orthodoxy in the community. Mm -hmm. And these, these conversations I find so interesting, but time goes so fast. We are completely out of time. And I know that uh, many had to leave for the one o'clock uh, classes. So um, I want to thank you, thank everyone for joining us today, both online and in the auditorium. And a big thank you to our guests, Dean Hillary Godwin and Dean Sandro Galea. And this is where we applaud. <laughs> So a couple of quick announcements before we depart. We hope you mark your calendars for the next Dean Leaders in Lanyap lecture on Wednesday, January 24th. We'll be joined by Dean Danielle Fallon, Danny Fallon at the Emory University School, of, um, Rollins School of Public Health, and Dean Perry Hilgastis um, at Rutgers University School of Public Health. I'd also highly encourage those who are here in person to stick around for a bit of lanyap in the um, DeBall Gallery. We have a very special exhibit named The Separating Sickness, all about the lives of patients at the Carville National Repertorium in Carville, Louisiana. Sponsored by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities, this exhibit was curated by Carville resident Anne Brett, whose parents were patients at the facility and took many of the photographs in the exhibit. Thank you all again, and I wish you all a wonderful holiday and new year. <laughs>